Hi, everybody. Well, we're almost done with the course. And one of the last main things that we have on our plate is the final research paper. And as I've been going through and grading your PRACI submissions, I've noticed that many of you have struggled to extract the main points or main arguments from each of these sources and the key information that they use as evidence to support their main points. Um, now, if you're struggling to extract the, the correct information, if you're struggling uh, as you read these sources and you're not really sure what you're supposed to be looking for, that's okay. Don't feel alone, you're not alone. Uh, this is a challenging assignment made more challenging by the fact that we're doing it in, con in a constrained time frame, uh, since this is only a four-week class, and we don't have the added benefit of being in a physical environment together like a classroom where we can help each other through the analytical process by discussing each one of these sources. So this video is to give you an overview so that you have a better understanding of uh, what this research project is about, the theme of the project itself, and also what you're supposed to be looking for in each one of these sources so that you can go back to each of those three sources uh, and find that key information that you need uh, as you put together your final research paper. So let's start with the theme of this because the whole theme of this paper really uh, hinges on Dr. Diamond's theory about why some civilizations throughout world history have become more powerful than others. All right, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna use that question, that's the question that he's attempting to answer in his book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, The Fates of Human Societies. We're gonna use that question, we're gonna look at his theory, and then we're gonna look at one piece of his evidence, which is the Spanish conquest of the Inca, and we're gonna compare that to how other people have interpreted that event, the Spanish conquest of the Inca, and just see how these different interpretations of that one piece of evidence fit into Dr. Diamond's overall theory about why some civilizations have become more powerful than others. So let's talk about that theme, that general question. Why are some civilizations more powerful than others? This is a question that can be applied to any time, any period in world history and human history, and it can be applied to our current day and age. Right, and looking at different regions of the world that have more wealth and resources and more power than others. Okay, so this is a question that we can really apply to any period in human history. He has posed this question by a black gentleman by the name of Yali in New Guinea on one of Diamond's trips to New Guinea where he studies uh, bird life and wildlife and spends a lot of time there. He loves the people there. He, he spends time around uh, this, you know, these particular uh, people groups and, and really admires the, their way of life. Um, and he's walking with Yali and Yali asks him a question. Why is it that white people have traditionally had so many resources, so much cargo, uh, and black people have not? All right. And he's specifically talking about Europeans or maybe in Diamond's case, Americans uh, versus people in New Guinea or people in Africa. But this question can really be applied to other parts of the world. As we look at the age of exploration from the late 15th century, the late 1400s onward, especially through the 19th century, during periods of exploration and conquest and colonization, we see that rather small European kingdoms in, in Western Europe were able to conquer large parts of the world. And, you know, Diamond wants to kind of keep peeling off the layers of the onion, keep going back deeper and deeper into world history to understand where the origin story is. How did these Western European kingdoms gain so many advantages that they were able to go to other parts of the world and conquer the people there, right? Now, one thing that Diamond is looking to do in this book is argue against an old racist Eurocentric explanation for this, which really nobody subscribes to anymore, nobody of any merit. But back in the day, and even into the you know mid 1900s, uh, many historians, sociologists, uh, anthropologists did s subscribe to this theory that there were biological differences, biological advantages uh, within white people that didn't exist within people of color, right? This is scientific racism. There is no factual basis for that theory, uh, but that was something that was posed for many years. And Dr. Diamond is 
very, very deliberately arguing against uh, that idea that there that any sort of biological or racial disparity uh, led to a disparity in technology and wealth and resources. A disparity just meaning, uh, you know, a, a gap, a difference. Some have more, some have less, that type of thing. And so he's saying, no, it has nothing to do with any biological or racial or cultural advantages. He says, in fact, in New Guinea and in other places where uh, the people are still aren't necessarily industrialized, many of them are far more intelligent, according to Dr. Diamond, than people who live in industrialized civilizations and societies. So intelligence and technological advancements, he says, don't go hand in hand. Um, and so he's looking at, you know, he's looking further back into human history. He's looking deeper into the story to try to figure out why it is that Europeans gained so much wealth and so many resources and had these technological advancements that other uh, indigenous peoples in other parts of the world did not have in the Americas or in Africa uh, and so on and so forth. So as he looks at everything and goes deeper and deeper back to uh, really what plays a role in civilizations developing and civilizations gaining uh, technological advancements, um, and, and progressing in that manner, um, he, he decides that really what made the difference has nothing to do with who you are as a person, you know, whether you're white or black or, uh, you know, you uh, practice this culture or this culture. It has to do with geographical differences. That's what made the difference between Europeans gaining so much technology and so many resources and other parts of the world not gaining those technological advancements and resources. So he says it has nothing to do with who you are so much as it has to do with where you are born, where your civilization rests geographically. So why then did the Europeans gain advantages that people in the Americas or people in Africa did not? And here's his explanation. He says that geographically, Things were able to spread from other parts of Eurasia to Western Europe uh, by diffusion, by trade, uh, by various means that didn't pass to peoples in Africa and people in the Americas. The way that Eurasia, Europe and Asia, is set up geographic geographically is that it's much larger from east to west than it is from north to south. There's a difference when you look at Africa and the Americas, which are much larger north to south than they are east to west. Now, what difference does that make? Well, east to west, okay, latitudinally, climates tend to be a little bit more consistent. Environments tend to be a little bit more consistent, which means that plant species and animal species can successfully thrive in parts to the east or west better than they can in moving north to south in the different climates that exist there. All right, now this is important because the Neolithic Revolution, as far as any of us know, really originated in Southwest Asia primarily. All right, and out of there sprung uh, agriculture, in many cases, uh, because other societies picked up on that and started to apply it in their own societies. This idea of uh, finding a place where you can cultivate the land, take these wild uh, plant species and learn how to plant them and cultivate them and harvest them, right? This sed uh, sedentary lifestyle where you, instead of being hunter-gatherers moving around everywhere, you settle in a location. This is why many of them did it near water, uh, especially near rivers where they could use that water to irrigate their crops and cultivate their crops. All right, so in many cases, out of there where the earliest Neolithic revolution uh, occurred, many others started to adopt it. Now, that's a different case for the Americas, which had no contact with the Neolithic revolution uh, in Southwest Asia and had its own Neolithic revolution uh, right around the same time or shortly thereafter. Um, however, out of that Neolithic revolution that kind of spawned in Southwest Asia, 
other societies, other people groups began to pick that up and that kind of spread across the Eurasian landmass, east to west. And these uh, plant species uh, like wheat or barley that really were first domesticated in Southwest Asia were able to move to East Asia or to uh, Western Europe and still survive, still thrive. People could still plant them there. They could use those same farming techniques east to west a lot easier than they would be able to do so north to south because of the changing climates. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Now, think about the next thing. Once people were settled and they were um, uh, planting uh, crops and using that as a food source, then they started to domesticate animals. Now, Diamond looks at that and he says, the number of domesticated farm animals that we have today are really rather limited. When you think about how many different animal species there are uh, in the world, and then you think about how many different animal species are used in farming, like cows, pigs, sheep, or sheep, goats. Um, I mean, when you dial it down, there aren't that many uh, farm animals in use or animals that have been domesticated. And he points to the fact that many of those animals, their origins were in the same place in, in Western Asia um, and, uh, and Central Asia. And, and out again, out of that kind of domestication of animals, those animals were able to move and migrate through trade or, or, or migration or any other means to other parts of Eurasia and again, thrive and be used for as a food source uh, or uh, to pull a plow, that type of thing, right? Now, all of this is important because if animals and plant species can that are domesticated can move east to west easier than north to south, that's one explanation why the Europeans were able to gain advantages from their neighbors who learned how to do these things and then they kind of passed it along to them through trade and contact, right? especially through the spread of the uh, Hellenic and, and, or Greek and Roman empires that covered these vast areas into Asia and into Western Europe. Um, so you have the spread of ideas within those empires as well. That sped up the transmission of uh, the, these practices of how to plant and cultivate and harvest crops and how to domesticate animals. All right, so Europeans gained an advantage from their proximity to these developments that were taking place in another part of Eurasia. Okay, in Africa and in America, it's in the Americas, it's not to say that they didn't have their own advancements taking place on their own systems of agriculture. They absolutely did. But when it came to domesticable animal species, that was one disadvantage uh, that, that the Americas and, uh, and Africa had compared to the readily domesticable animals uh, that were available in Eurasia. All right, so that's one thing. Now, why is that all important? Well, because if you remember when we looked at civilizations, we saw that in order for people to start specializing in other roles besides food production, you have to have enough of a food surplus, more food than you need to feed people who aren't gonna be actively producing food themselves. So in order for there to be priests and politicians and soldiers uh, and artisans who are, you know, developing pots, uh, people who are, um, you know, developing a system of writing, uh, people who are uh, working on infrastructure and inventing new ways to, um, uh, to irrigate crops, those types of things, those people that are using their time and efforts and energies on things other than food production still need to eat, right? So you have to have enough of a food surplus to feed people who aren't going to be focused on creating food themselves. Now, when that happens, now you have the ability for these people to really develop new technologies, to start working with materials that are in the earth and, and learn how to harness them, such as iron, right, or bronze, uh, and learn how to um, to manipulate those minerals, those metals, um, and then create new tools, create new weapons, and those types of things. All right, so food surpluses are key to civilizations uh, developing 
and, uh, and making technological advancements, all right? So access to domesticable plants and animals, huge geographic advantage, right? Access to other societies and civilizations that are coming up with these technological advancements or these agricultural uh, practices, your, your ability to get ideas from them, to get tools from them, uh, and then apply that to your own uh, society, your own civilization, and then build off of those developments. So those points of contact and transmission between societies are key. And Eurasia allowed for all of this, for the transmission of food, for the transmission of agricultural practices and other ideas, as we've seen for the transmission of uh, religious beliefs as well, uh, but the transmission of technological advancements, all right? So the East-West geographical makeup of this uh, region and of Eurasia and the available plant species and animal species that could be domesticated uh, and, and uh, you know, cultivated really gave an advantage to people living on the Eurasian landscape. Now, that's going way back, you know, eight, 10,000 years ago the, with the Neolithic revolution and then ever since then. But let's kind of speed up the process then and get to his evidence, one of his points of evidence. And it's just one point of evidence, but that's all we have time to look at in this course. And that is how the Europeans over time gaining all of these advantages that, that they got from their geographic location, right? Were able to go over to other parts of the world, particularly in this piece of evidence, to the Americas. And he's looking at how Pizarro and 168 ragtag soldiers walked in to the Inca Empire and essentially captured their king and took that empire down. Now, the actual conquest took many years, but literally in like one day, they had the king. At Cajamarca, they met Atahualpa and his army and were able to create enough chaos and defeat enough men to capture Atahualpa. And from that point forward, really dictated uh, the terms and the direction in many ways of their conquest. All right. Now, this is what Diamond is going to use as evidence, because he's going to say that there, those geographical advantages that the Europeans had came into play here. And this is as dramatic an example as we can get, according to Diamond. Because if 168 men can defeat an army of tens of thousands on their own home turf, why is that? All right, it has to be because of some of these advantages they gained from their geographic location. So he starts to look at their advantages and he says that the factors that really played in to Pizarro's victory over the Inca were their weaponry, were horses, and disease. All right, those are really the three main things that he points to. Okay, if you tie that now to his theory, the weapons that they had came from the metalwork that they had accomplished. Uh, from working with steel. They had superior steel weapons compared to the Inca weapons, which were not made of steel. They hadn't really gotten into ironwork at that point. They knew how to work with metal. They knew how to work with gold. Um, I believe bronze as well, but not steel, which is the hardest, most durable and sharpest uh, metal for weaponry, right? Especially during that time. So they didn't have the same level of weaponry, um, according to European standards anyway, as the Spanish did. Now, why did the Spanish have more advanced metallurgy or the ability to work with iron better than the Inca? Well, according to Diamond, it's because they picked it up uh, from other parts of Eurasia, where iron work and, and working with bronze and then working with steel uh, was really developed and advanced, and then the Europeans picked it up, and they continued to build on that, um, and uh, and continued to master how to create a hardened steel blade. Now they also had some guns with them, but those guns were pretty weak, 
uh, at the time that they uh, Pizarro and his men met Atahualpa and the Inca. Uh, they were difficult to load. Uh, they misfired often. Um, you know, they took a lot of time to load, and you could only load one uh, round at a time. Uh, so how much impact guns really had uh, on that outcome when the Spanish defeated the Inca and captured Atahualpa at Cajamarca in 1532, minimal. But he says that the steel swords and their steel armor definitely played a factor. Um, and he believes that the horses uh, and the way that the Spanish were able to use the horses to their advantage uh, definitely gave them advantages over the Inca who did not have the horse. They had not seen a horse. Horses did not exist in America before European contact. Uh, they had llamas, but uh, llamas do not function as horses do. Um, and so that was an advantage, according to Diamond. And of course, we can certainly say, all right, well, there's a geographical advantage, according to Diamond, right? Because they have horses. The Americas didn't have horses. Why do the Europeans have horses? Well, it's not because the horse was uh, uh, like originated in Europe. It originated in the Eurasian steppe. Remember we learned about in chapter 11? That flat grassland, that's really where the horse came out of uh, that spread from Eastern Europe to, to uh, cent through Central Asia. Um, and, but over time, it had moved and migrated and people had taken the horse with them and they'd taken the uh, horsemanship skills and other things that people have, had developed in the steppe over to ultimately Western Europe. So by the time the Spanish are hitting the shores of the Americas, they have horses. They've had horses for many, many, many years. They've developed as great horsemen, very skilled horsemen, uh, and they have, they've used these horses in battle. So that's a geographical advantage. Um, and then lastly, germs, right, disease. And there are a couple of reasons why this is what Diamond, you know, this falls under what Diamond considers a geographical uh, advantage. And that is just because the germs seem to move in one direction. Very little disease transmitted from Native Americans to Europeans that wiped out Europeans remotely uh, close to the way that European diseases decimated Native American populations. I mean, completely destroyed Native American populations. It's estimated that probably 90% of Native Americans were wiped out by European diseases. I mean, when you think about that number, it's it's insane. Um, and that's spreading from South America through North America. So the, the casualties that European diseases inflicted on the Native American populations who'd never been exposed to those diseases was catastrophic and certainly led to uh, further European conquest because it took out the majority of the Native American populations, right? So why is this a geographical advantage? Well, because the Europeans, uh, in having farm animals, many diseases are spread from, from animals to humans. And have, being in close proximity to animals, domesticated animals, over many, many years, and being exposed to many different people from many different parts of the world, um, especially during the Crusades, when Euro Western Europeans were going over to Southwest Asia um, and uh, you know fighting in this war over the Holy Land, um, they were coming into contact with you know various diseases and germs from other parts of the world. Also, during the time of, uh, of really globalizing trade, where uh, Genoa and Venice were kind of the captains of uh, the trade world in the Mediterranean. And they were taking these goods that were coming from merchants uh, from India and from East Asia and Central Asia. And then they were then taking these goods and you know spreading them through Europe. Um, this was a point of contact where diseases and germs spread from all parts of Eurasia and even North Africa. And this is what led in large part to the Black Death, the transmission of the bubonic plague, right? Now, by the time Europeans are exploring the Americas and elsewhere in the late 1400s, the Black Death had come and gone in the 1300s. The people that were left had built up an immunity 
to these diseases that they had been in contact with. And yes, many millions of people died from the Black Death, uh, but those that survived had an immunity. And it doesn't mean that they weren't carrying those germs in them. It just means that those germs didn't affect them. But when they made contact with unexposed people in the Americas who'd never come into contact with these diseases before because of their isolation from Eurasia, now all of a sudden they were completely susceptible. All right, so these are all of parts of why Jared Diamond says these geographical factors came into play at the point that Pizarro and his 168 men met out of Walpa and his army of tens of thousands, and that's why they were able to capture him, and that's why they were able to take down the Inca on their own home turf, and that's why Cortez was able to do the same thing uh, against the Aztecs, and that's why the Europeans in general have been able to amass more cargo and uh, and really conquer and colonize these other peoples and other parts of the world, all right? So there's his theory about geographical advantages. Here's his evidence used in the case of Pizarro and his men defeating the Inca. Okay, now we have something to hold on to and now we can go to these two other sources and we can see, okay, how do they interpret the factors that led to the Spanish defeating the Inca? And do they agree with Diamond or do they disagree with Diamond? And are the factors that they present, do, do the factors that Cahill and Mann present have anything to do with geographic uh, advantages of the Europeans or something else altogether? All right, so that's what you want to compare. So that at the end of this, paper, you're able to have explained what Jared Diamond's theory about world civilizations is and why some civilizations have come to be more wealthy and more powerful than others. You're able to explain how he defends that argument um, by presenting the case of the Spanish conquest of the Inca, and you're able to explain the different factors that he said were at play when the Spanish defeated the Inca, and how those factors relate to geographical advantages, how they relate to his overall theory, right? And you're able to explain the factors that Cahill presents, how those compare to Diamond's factors of the Spanish versus the Inca, and how Cahill's relate or don't relate to Diamond's theory of geographic advantages. And you do the same thing for Charles Mann, all right? And at the end of it all, you're able to say which interpretation was the most effective, which interpretation of the Spanish conquest of the Inca, who presented the best and most convincing interpretation based on the factors that they laid out. And was there anything that Jared Diamond missed? Maybe Jared Diamond has a good argument, but he didn't take into consideration some of these things that David Cahill and Charles Mann are discussing, or he didn't pay enough attention to them. And if that's the case, then maybe Dr. Diamond doesn't have the most convincing interpretation of why the Spanish were able to conquer the Inca um, out of these three. Maybe Diamond's isn't the best interpretation or most convincing in your mind, but let's go back to his overall theory. Does that, that then hurt his theory? So if you don't think that Jer Jared Diamond's interpretation of why the Spanish were able to conquer the Inca is the most convincing because you think, I think Dr. Diamond didn't focus enough on what Charles Mann was saying here. If you think that's the case, does that weaken Dr. Diamond's overall theory? Or do you still believe that he's right in that? That maybe his evidence was a little bit weak in this case because he didn't consider some of these things that Charles Mann or David Cahill presented. But overall, his theory still holds up because at the end of the day, there were geographical advantages that the Europeans had that enabled them to conquer the peoples of the Americas and the Inca specifically, according to this evidence. And you can certainly make that case because one thing you're gonna find in common across all of these uh, sources is disease. No one can uh, exclude disease as being a huge factor 
and why the Europeans were successful in conquering Native American civilizations. All right, and that, again, you can point back to and say there's a geographical advantage. So that supports Dr. Diamond's overall theory. Um, but here are some other things that weakened his case. All right, when you look at Cahill, this is what I want you to look for. Cahill looks at the organization of the Inca Empire and how it was uh, really governed in small sections by kind of, you know, like smaller chiefdoms, so to speak, which would allow for it to kind of, uh, uh, I guess, fracture a little bit easier, right? Um, another thing that he looks at is these various uh, Native American societies and people groups who were conquered by the Inca, who had to pay tribute to the Inca, who had to work and labor for the Inca, uh, who therefore kind of resented the Inca, who wanted control back over their own people. And so when they saw the Spanish arrive and they saw that the Spanish were going to take out this Inca empire, they aligned themselves with the Spanish thinking like, hey, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. If I help the Spanish out and weaken the Inca, then I will be able to regain sovereignty, regain control of my people and my land. All right, so that's another factor he presents, and you want to go into detail on that and talk about how convincing that is. And then, of course, he talks about um, disease. But one thing that he does is he specifically talks about Jared Diamond a lot um, because he argues that in Diamond's uh, interpretation of why the Spanish were successful uh, in conquering the Inca, he kind of downplays how advanced the Inca actually were. He gives a, you know, a lot more credit to the Europeans uh, and doesn't mention certain things uh, of the Inca, such as, for example, he talks a lot about writing. Um, you know, Diamond, we don't get into it too much in the excerpt, but in the video you probably saw he talks about how writing benefited uh, Europeans because they were able to learn from previous conquests and previous exploits, previous successes and failures, and then turn around and apply that in future conquests and uh, future expeditions. All right, and he says that, you know, in uh, Inca society, they didn't have an advanced system of writing. They weren't able to really learn from uh, previous um, wars and battles and so on and so forth. And really that's diminishing oral tradition and the the power of, of oral history and the ability to pass down information. Um, and then, you know, Cahill even argues that uh, kipu, which is a, a system of tying knots into thread that many people originally thought was a, a way to calculate things and, and keep records of things in the Inca, may have actually been a form of three-dimensional writing. So Cahill's just arguing that like, hey, you know, it's easy to simplify these uh, these civilizations like the Inca um, as part of the process of showing advantages that the Europeans had, but let's not simplify them too much. Let's make sure that we, you know, call out all of the ways in which they were advanced, because if we do, then maybe we'll find that the Europeans didn't have so many advantages over the, uh, or bring so many advantages over the Inca to the table when they met each other, but maybe it was actually things that were going on in the Inca Empire uh, that weakened them. So it's not that the, the Europeans were stronger per se, it's that the Inca were weakening at the time that the Spaniards arrived. And Mann certainly talks about that when he talks about the civil war that was taking place, uh, how disease had already started to trickle in ahead of Pizarro, uh, because the Spanish had already been uh, in parts of South America and in parts of, uh, of Mesoamerica as well. Uh, and so disease had already trickled in and was already, already starting to kill off some of the Inca, including royalty, uh, which caused the dispute over who would uh, be the next in line. So there was kind of a, a, a factionalism there, a civil war that was taking place that was weakening uh, the Inca Empire right at the time that the Spanish get in uh, and meet them at Cajamarca. And so that gave the Spanish an advantage. And he talks about disease and factionalism a lot. Man also talks about why the horse wasn't so much of an advantage and why uh, Spanish weapons and Spanish armor weren't so much of an advantage because really the Inca had a very advanced system of armor 
and weaponry, although it may have looked more simplistic to the human eye. Uh, it was, in fact, rather advanced. So he talks about that. And you want to draw out all these things because you want to compare these different interpretations to each other so that you can assess who was the most effective and why and whether or not you find Dr. Diamond's overall theory about geographical advantages being the biggest and most important determining factor in why some civilizations are more powerful than others. If you find that theory effective, you want to be able to explain that too. So hopefully now you know how to go back into those sources and pull out the information that you need and comb through it, scan through it, and find that key information uh, that you need so that you can put your notes together and, uh, and write up an effective paper. If I see a great attempt from you uh, and you show that you've read the sources and your work is not anybody else's, and where you do take information from the sources, you cite those with parenthetical citations, diamond, comma, and the page number, and so on and so forth. If you do that and you meet the formatting requirements, then you're going to do just fine. Um, but if you don't read the sources and you don't put the time and effort in uh, to a, a good, solid attempt to construct a research paper that meets the prompt and follows the formatting requirements, then obviously you won't do so well. So do your best work, go back to the sources, review them over this next day, put together your final paper um, and submit that and, uh, and I'm sure that you'll do just fine. If you have any questions in the meantime, uh, please email me and let me know. But otherwise, I hope this video helped to explain it a little bit better. I'm sorry it took so long, but uh, hopefully it's worthwhile and uh, helps you uh, put together a better paper than you would have otherwise.